funny thing about life, but especially about Apple Five, things can always get worse. I kind of wish the voiceover over the intro wasn't there. It feels a bit too obvious. Too many of the things that were being shown on screen didn't need to be told as well. Because they were already doing a f perfectly adequate job of showing us what was actually happening and the significance of that, so... Yeah. I want to talk very briefly about a writing problem. It's so rare I get to talk about writing concepts in Babylon 5, because most of that stuff I've already talked about in Voyager, and a lot of that Babylon 5 doesn't do. But there is one thing B5 has that's unique Excuse me, over uh, Voyager, and that's the string continuity. You know, I don't think I've defined that recently, so just to give you a brief refresher. String continuity is when one episode leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. It's more commonly referred to as arcs. But in the case of a show like B5, the arcs go throughout the whole series. So, while there are the occasional episodes that are background stuff, it's still happening in between here and in between here, and the events of all of these episodes affect them. That's string continuity. Now, that sounds like a duh. But basically, string continuity is actually, or at least was, kind of rare in television. The more common thing to do in television was to do the exact opposite. Um, TNG was actually kind of unusual for having setting continuity. There were background events that would move forward and change, the introduction of the Borg, the establishment of you know, android rights, uh, you know, little things like that would carry forward throughout TNG. But for the most part, each episode could be slotted in basically wherever because that was the preference. It is only nowadays, you know, as of now when I'm recording this, 2017, where having string continuity shows is actually the norm, which is quite unusual, uh, really. At least, if you were to rewind time about 20 years, it'd be quite unusual. So, I mentioned that string continuity thing. Occasionally you have a background character, and as a writer, it's a challenge to make that character a part of the background without being obvious about it. JMS himself actually spoke about this, which is kind of what prompted me to talk about it. He mentions the writing challenge of, you know, you, you, can't, you can't bring them into every episode. There's, there's, there's production and issues with having, for example, Adira be relevant in each episode. Yet you still want them to be there in some way, and yet if you do the obvious choice, which I, I'm going to try and quote him, this was basically, man, I miss Adira, so what's for dinner? Then that calls attention to it in its own right, which means then you have to deal with it immediately, not when it would be natural for the course of the story to deal with it. So, it's a fine line to, bow, to, to, to strike there. I personally uh, find that to be an incredible challenge as a writer, trying to make it known that there's still a character in the background that is still relevant for things that will happen in the future. You know, Adira was part of continuity and part of Londa's character arc. But they couldn't just constantly bring her up without actually doing something with her until they were ready to do something with her, which was this episode, right? You, you see where I'm coming with this? It's a huge challenge as a writer. Now, if you're doing, like, a literary work, as in a book or a short story or something, you have what I call Meanwhile Elsewheres, which is exactly what it sounds like. Meanwhile Elsewhere, where the, where the action cuts over to here, and you could show just a little snippet. It doesn't have to be long, not even an entire chapter. It could be just a little chunk here that shows what's happening in the background to help the viewers, or excuse me, the readers, keep in mind the fact that that character is still there in the background and is still relevant. You could also go inside a character's head, their thoughts, when it comes to that. So, for example, Londo could have, you know, if this was a book, could have thought, ah, Adira. But when you're doing a television show, you're limited by getting the actor involved, and making sure it doesn't interrupt the flow of the show, making sure it doesn't seem too out of bounds, you know, there's in a, you see, there's actually a lot of issues, real functional practicality issues with regards to making that character relevant. What is done in this episode is probably one of the most common solutions to this problem. Flashbacks. Now, <laughs> I admit I have a little bit of negative bias towards flashbacks, but that's mostly because flashbacks are usually portrayed very, very poorly. In this episode, there are actually two series of flashbacks. Uh, one to Adira, back when that first happened. Uh, I forget if that's season one or two off the top of my head, forgive me. And then one to the Lord Rifa thing, which was actually just a few episodes ago. Admittedly, it's not a perfect solution. I personally would look at that and be like, ah, oh, do I have to do that? But JMS did the exact same thing. He was like, ah, oh, do I have to do that? 
but it really is the only serviceable answer to the keep a background character relevant problem when that background character isn't even an extra. It, she was a guest star, you know. Paying for repeated guest stars is actually kind of pricey on a television show. It's one of the reasons why we only had a dozen or so Q episodes, despite the tremendous popularity of Q and John Delancey in general over on Star Trek. Same thing with Barkley, actually, to use another parallel there. So, uh, there's a couple of arcs going through this. I'm going to hit Franklin's first, I think. My notes are all over the place, because the episode kept jumping between these three arcs. It's interesting. So, let's talk about Franklin's overdosing. He is, of course, totally losing it. I agree with Garibaldi's perspective. He was borderline hysterical. And it's funny, because even knowing it was coming, I still noticed the, the mistake. Nine PSI on a lung? That's dangerously low. Thirteen is kind of low, but nine? And, of course, he says that, and immediately after, he's like, Oh, my God, how'd it get so low? Get it up to thirteen! And Garibaldi actually did bother to go back and check the records because Franklin made a mistake that nearly killed patient. Now, that's an important place to start, I think. Because if you've been paying attention, Garibaldi, as Franklin's friend, has been kind of chill so far. Keeping out of it, but kind of poking at him about it for every now and again. As I mentioned last time, it makes so much sense that of all people, Garibaldi would be the one to understand Franklin's dilemma and to reach out to him for it. Remember... Garibaldi was an alcoholic, not I drink occasionally, an alcohol an alcoholic. Excuse me, an alcoholic. Did I should just say that, an alcoholic. He had a real problem. He knew what it was like. He knew what it was like to get through it. He knows what it's like now, having gotten through it. That was a difficult thing for him. So of course he would be the kind of person who would be understanding and sympathetic, and try to help Franklin. Not just because their friendship, but because he's been there. Now, I do have to point out, though, that what Franklin did does technically push the boundaries. And I want you to save that in the back of your mind, because I have something more to talk about with regards to that. But keep in mind, Garibaldi didn't bring this up until Franklin nearly killed a guy, basically. Franklin's mistake nearly killed a patient. It was literally luck that he saved his life. In fact, my first time viewing this, I didn't think he was going to save him. Because reinflating a lung back up to 13 PSI that quickly, well, they said it right in the episode. Pop. Now they got lucky. They didn't die. They could have. I do find it interesting how Franklin refuses the truth to Garibaldi, too. Keeping in mind, Franklin does know he has a problem with stims. Keeping in mind, Franklin has at least some self-awareness. And at first I thought that was inconsistent, but then he gives that beautiful speech. I wish I had it word for word, but I couldn't find a transcript of it in time. Uh, I, I just occurred to me, I have like two other sites I could have checked for that. But anyways, he says, you know, you, science, medical science, when you get down to it, is all about the numbers. If you're at X, you're fine. If you're at Y, you're addicted. It's, it's all about the numbers. And it's so easy to just lose track. But the numbers don't lie. I bring that up because I think that in admitting that he had a problem, he then, partially out of ego, partially out of, as he himself puts it, fear, said, no, no, I don't have a problem, and went full tilt into the worst aspects of that level of addiction. By the way, as an aside, I do like the fact that Franklin began his addiction because of his desire to do good. In fact, the need. Remember, he is. it's not like he just has a workaholic perspective, although he kind of does. They were understaffed, constantly. And that was before they separated from Earth. Now they're understaffed and in an even worse situation than before. And that brings me to the, the topic I wanted to talk about. Although, one real quick thing. I do very much like the fact that Garibaldi says, no, it's not my decision, it's your decision. And Franklin does the right thing. He resigns. The reason I put that in quotes, though, is because this is a much more complicated situation than it probably looks like. Yes, his mistake nearly cost a patient's life, but they are understaffed. He is a very good doctor, and they're understaffed. 
and he's resigning <laughs> to figure out himself and his life and his personality and to get free of his stim addiction. That's great from a morality perspective, from a right and wrong perspective, from a perspective of, I hope you feel better and you become a better person. But there are more mundane needs that need to be attended to as well. And that's why I say this is a complicated situation. Because whether or not Franklin made the correct choice is a much more complicated question. And one I will not place judgment on. I'm curious what you think, actually. Did Franklin make the correct choice? Was it correct to deprive a already understaffed medical facility on an already understaffed station, barely struggling to gather together an alliance against the shadows in the middle of effectively two separate wars, although one of the wars is basically a proxy of the other, I'll give you that. Was that the correct decision to do that? See, that's the interesting thing, because rules exist for a reason, right? Well, most rules exist for a reason. So you could argue that he had to resign because it was illegal to be addicted to stims. But if you're paying attention, he didn't do that. And Garibaldi went out of his way to not push that effort. He finally got to the point where he was going to do it, and without seeing Franklin, decided, no, I'm not crossing that line. I'm not going to pull legality on him. Because, let's be honest, and by the way, you notice Garibaldi is very chaotic good again in this episode, completely willing to bypass rules and regs if he needs to in order to get stuff done. So he's not really, he doesn't want to pull rank. He doesn't want to pull legality. He, want, he doesn't want to say you're unfit for duty. He wants to help his friend. And he wants his friend to help himself. But my reason for pointing out the legality thing is that's not why Franklin steps down. Franklin steps down to go sort out his life. Legality, ironically, doesn't really apply in this situation. There's also, there's of course the wonderful argument of what legality exists when you have formally seceded from your government, but more to the point, they are understaffed, they are in a crisis situation, and things are going to keep getting worse. And I think everyone knows that. So it would be very easy, and I have no doubt that Sheridan and several other people involved would be okay with bending the rules under the right circumstances to allow him to keep going. Like Garibaldi did, for a year. Like his own staff did, into and including this episode. Think about it. I mention this because the whole rules exist for a reason quote, those reasons have to be very carefully defined to the moment, to the immediate circumstance, the medium circumstance, and the long-term circumstance that you are standing in right here, right now. You have to apply the rules, yes, but your own thoughts, your own feelings, and the reality of your situation and what it will become. You have to take into account all aspects, not just one narrow thing when defining your future. That's why I say I'm not sure if Franklin made the correct choice. Because as horrible as it sounds in the cold calculus of things, even if he did start causing the deaths of patients, his absence will almost assuredly cause more. I don't mean deliberately, of course. I mean in the absence of a skilled and competent doctor who is no longer providing aid. Because medics and medicine are both very finite resources, after all. Think about it. Uh, do I have anything else about Franklin? I don't think I do. Uh... Let's talk about Londo. Londo is a great character as ever. There's a there's a tiny little scene. I love Peter Jurassic's performance. He has owned the role from day one. He really has. S stepped in onto the stage and basically was Londo. There's a tiny little scene right before he meets Mr. Morden for the first time in this episode where he literally has a spring in his step. But it's very subtle. It's just he's kind of bubbly. And I only mention that to get across just how great of an actor he is, that he can do that kind of a body language thing. And there's this wonderful bit where, where he hears the shadows chittering around him. And at first he seems afraid, but then he starts to realize the more mundane truth of he is being threatened. And he doesn't flinch. And he doesn't cower. 
And in the end, he says to Mr. Morton, there is nothing you can do to me that has not already been done to me. The great irony, of course, is that that is not true. Although Londo didn't really realize that yet. I'm going to bring up a question. Those of you who have seen the rest of the series, keep, keep spoilers out of this as ever, but do you think Londo actually knew Morden was involved in Adira's death? There's a lot of things he does and says that indicate he might have been. And of course, Londo has a frickin' brain. Londo is also an extremely versed politician and knows how you say something by saying the exact opposite of it. And Mr. Morden is an expert at saying something while saying the exact opposite. It's actually quite rare Mr. Morden is very blunt and very blatant around people. Usually when you do, that's when things are bad. <laughs> but, I'm okay, so I'm ju I just posit that question to you. Because Londo is in an interestingly similar pers position that Bester was in just the previous episode. He is, he is effectively a villain, Londo is. I think there's no real denying that at this point. I, I, I mentioned that in the, in the previous episode. I forget the name of it. Veer, Transit, something, something. Veer, Sick, Transit, I think. I don't know. Anyways. But it is within the feasibility of him turning around and being an ally of the Army of Light, being an ally of the good guys again, through Adira, in the same way that Bester was. For the same basic reasons, actually. Although I would argue Londo is less of an evil person than Bester, but I mean, we're talking shadings of dark at this point. But it could have been a thing that helped Londo to, for lack of a better way to put it, recover his soul. With Veer back, his conscience back, he will hopefully start to get better. I mentioned that in the episode where Veer came back, the one I just talked about. But with Adira back, he might have been able to recover to the point where he could really... Well, be a good guy again. Be one of the allies again. Or be a good guy for the first time, you could argue. Now, I mentioned that. <sighs> it's so horrible. Some pe People have argued the morality of Londo Malari for years. I have heard so many different debates over the years. And I've heard new debates from you guys in the viewing comments down below. And I've, I've gobbled them up. There's so many interesting perspectives on this character. He's a very in-depth character, and with complexity comes different shadings of opinion, different shadings of perspective. We all see different things in something that is complex. Whereas, if you have a blue triangle, it's a blue triangle, and nobody's really going to look at that and be like, well, it's obviously a green square, you know? So with something this complex, it's so natural that we could have these different interpretations of the character, and I love that. But I mention this because I have been of the, of the opinion that while Londo is certainly culpable for a lot of the things he has done, the deck was always stacked against him, from day one, really. And that deck was so brutally stacked against him, and brutally stacked against him, until he was ground down into the dirt. It was only when Londo was at his lowest that he was willing to accept Mr. Morden's original deal, if you'll remember. Yeah, you, you see where I'm going with this, because... Londo is now at his worst in a different way. Different perspective, different mindset. But he is once again at his worst, and then he accepts a deal with Mr. Morden. And I think the garbage truck's going by, so forgive me for the next minute or so. There might be a little extra noise in the background. Speaking from personal experience, ow, just thinking about it hurt. <laughs> there is no feeling in the entire world worse than when you see when you think or it is perceived to be something great is going to happen something amazing it's not hard to picture picture something that would really make your life better right now i don't care what it is and in, but you don't have to share with me or in the comments to share with the world but just picture something that would truly make your life amazing right now now picture that just after you have that, just after that's presented to you and you're like, oh my god, really? And just when you get over the shock and you're about to embrace this amazing thing, nope! It's much worse than it was before, isn't it? Because it's been taken from you. And now you know what the opposite feels like. 
It is the worst feeling. And in Londo's case, it wasn't even just that. She's dead. There's no resurrection, not really, in this setting. There's no bringing her back. There's no undoing that damage. So not only is the, this one bright spot removed from his life forever, but he now knows that it is because of him. His life is now actually worse than it was before that bright spot entered his life. Think about it. Think about what that would feel like. I like Veer's reaction. Veer got it immediately. Veer actually moved to hug him. Think about that for a moment. Veer is not exactly a very physically intimate guy, and neither is Londo. But without hesitation, Veer just opened up his heart to Londo, understanding how horrible this had to have been. And Londo can't even take it. He just slumps off, disconsolate. And he doesn't... I, I like how, again, the actor presents total grief. A lot of actors have presented grief a, a lot over the years in different ways. But the one way I always have disliked the most is the loud bawling. Oh, God. Oh. You know what I mean, right? It's, I can't even do it properly. I was kind of mocking it there. But you, you, you understand what I mean, right? Really showing powerful grief is actually quite a challenge for an actor. And I like what Peter Jurassic does. He turns away from the camera and uses just his body language and his posture and very, very... He's not actually sobbing. He's on the edge of crying, but he's not because he's still in such utter shock over the matter. It's a very powerful scene. <laughs> and then, of course, he asks Mr. Morton not for justice. He makes a point of that, actually. He asks for revenge. Oh, and the safety of his people. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. I think this is the second or third time I've brought it up on my show, on Babylon 5, on my Babylon 5 Ruminations. Keep that in mind. It's like third or fourth time I've brought it up. Londo wanted to ensure the safety of his people. Keep that back there. <sighs> poor, poor Londo. God. Several times in all three of the major plots of this episode, the question is asked in different words. It's very clever about it. What do the shadows want? It's actually interesting because JMS himself acknowledged how much he was kind of making an emphasis of that in the script. They all say it in different ways, but they keep bringing it up. What exactly do the shadows want? What is it that you want? What is it you're accomplishing? You know, what is the goal? You know? Naturally, we don't actually know the Shadow's goal, unless you've seen the show before, in which case, as ever, no spoilers. But let's talk about the other plot, the wonderful politics of the Shadow's policy. It is an amazing strategy, really, if your only goal is to break apart and destroy and or conquer everyone else. You're a big fist. There's a lot of little fists. There's a pretty good chance, it's just assume for a moment, that if all those little fists united, they could hurt you. They might not be able to defeat you, but they could hurt you. Okay, so I'm going to attack... No, I'm going to back those little fists right there. And then I'm going to attack those little fists over there. Then I'm going to betray these little fists over here. Then I'm going to sit back and attack things at random. Nobody knows who's going to get attacked next, and for what purpose. Everybody now knows there's no point in allying with the Shadows, and people are now afraid of allying with each other. It is actually brilliant in its own right, this, this whole situation. And then there's, of course, the quote, I actually wrote it down, If we join, we are not... Uh, if we join, we are noticed. We invite attack. That mentality right there explains the Shadow stratagem in a nutshell. It's actually kind of how I always pictured the Reapers, to be completely honest with you. Forgive me for segueing for a moment, but I've never bought into the idea that the Reapers are some big, super amazing, powerful, undestoppable force. I've bought into the fact that they are a very powerful force that is limited, just like everyone else is. Even in Mass Effect 1, we learn that the Reapers have been manipulating the situation to break apart the races and to limit how much they have to fight back against, to limit the resistance to their invasion, right? Mass Effect 2, that's 100% codified. We're not talking about the third game right now. So, <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually, that's exactly how I perceive the shadows here. The shadows are certainly stronger. If they just wanted to, they could just sweep over everyone. 
but instead they play all the other races against each other. And Sheridan hits on the perfect idea. Let's just unify. And it's the perfect idea because it's so utterly unlikely to happen. I've talked about this recently within the Voyager episode, Void. And when you are in such dire straits, there's really only two methods of existence that come to mind. Parasitic and symbiotic. Parasitic, you take from others in hopes that you continue to exist. That's what the one ambassador, I forget the name of the race, forgive me, is, is positing to do within this episode. It may not seem like it because they're not actually attacking their neighbors. But by deliberately keeping themselves hidden, refusing to join the whole, they are taking, in a more passive manner, from those around them. Just as Franklin's absence can cause deaths, their absence can cause deaths. Remember, choosing not to act is still a choice and still an action. So, they have decided to choose that perspective, and Sheridan is trying to push the symbiotic method of existence. If we all unite, we can share resources, share information, share firepower, maybe do something about the situation. Just like in the void, it, we've got a bit of seesaw effect here. The moment things start to turn, the moment we start to get people signing in for this army of light, the more and more other people start signing up for it. As soon as the Vorlons finally interfered, people started signing up left and right. Huh. I find myself wondering what Kosh had to do to convince the other Vorlons of that. Because not only does he convince them to intervene, knowing things that I'm not going to talk about right now, but he also does so... And he convinces them to adhere to it, to adhere to what he was trying to accomplish. Because if the Vorlons had done a number of other things that they could have done, including admitted the death of Kosh, as pointed out in the episode, it would have destroyed the Alliance. Because Seesaw Effect is very susceptible to this. Right here. Think about it. That kind of brings me to the big scene. You know... <laughs> Actually, really quick, I just want to say the War in Heaven scene was great. It's a term from Stellaris. It's a 4X game. You should look into it if you haven't, or if you like 4X games. Um, seeing the Vorlons fight the Shadows was a treat. And you, you really see what happens when you put tonnage against tonnage like that. People way higher than in tech level and firepower than the rest of us duking it out. Hence the term, the war in heaven. Actually, I want to mention one other thing about Sheridan's idea. I can't remember where I mentioned this. This actually came up recently in one of my streams or one of my ruminations. But it was a situation in which if everyone involved in the circumstance had decided to unilaterally unify, they would have won. There was, like, no question. They would have unified, they would have won, they would have moved forward. The end. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But they couldn't. Or rather, they wouldn't. Everyone had their own agenda, their own perspective, their own ideas. They had their own policies, they had their own goals. Some people actively were against each other. You know, it's one of those things about diversity. We are different from each other. I know, crazy! But there it is. It's one of the reasons I like the theme in fiction as well as in real life of uni uh, unification in, in spite of diversity. It's something I've spoken on in Mass Effect, again, all over the place. You know, in my opinion, Mass Effect's big, ultra-core, mega-super-mondo, you get what I mean, their primary theme of Mass Effect, the core pillar around which the entire rest of the series is built, is unification despite diversity. The fact that we are all different and we still unify in a common manner towards a common goal and are not the same. I really want to emphasize that point. Unification and tolerance and understanding do not mean you're the same as me. It means you're different from me and that's cool. But the reality when it comes to politics, when it comes to war, gets a little more murky. Because Sheridan's idea is not only the obvious one, it's the correct one. If they all unified, they would be able to put a fairly strong front against the Shadows. And, yeah, 
they probably wouldn't be able to win, not without some things happening in the future. But they'd be able to do something about it. But there's all those problems. And there's all those difficulties. It's kind of like trying to convince a mass of people that they can defeat a guy with a flamethrower. It's going to be hard to convince the people in the front of that mass, isn't it? The one person, the one nation, the one species. Because you have to think about it from that perspective. You have to accept that you are asking people to basically sacrifice of themselves for the sake of the whole. And that's not something that's easy for people to swallow. Especially for people who have different cultural perspectives or different political ideals or different military ideals. Why did Kosh agree to help? That's an interesting question. I wrote it down here. I have my answer, of course. I posit it to you. Why did Kosh agree to help? Not why did the Vorlons go with it. Why did Kosh take action? The scene between Kosh and Sheridan, and the scene between Kosh and Sheridan, both of those scenes are awesome. But the second one was really powerful because it got across what you can't really do with the encounter suit. The encounter suit, you can only convey so much information. But they had a real actor with emotion in his tone and body language and all the tools an actor has to try and convey what Kosh really felt to Sheridan. And I love how throughout the dream, Sheridan, very slowly, like you can see about halfway through the scene, Sheridan has started to pick up on the fact that this is not a dream, and this is not his dad. And then by the end of it, he knows absolutely he is talking to Kosh. And when he jumps out of the bed, he knows what just happened. It's a powerful scene. It's an amazing scene. And... I, 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 I don't even know what to ruminate on it. I could just play the scene for you right now, if not for Warner Brothers, and, and just showcase it so you could understand how amazing it is. Everything he says to him is brilliant. You know, I was afraid. I, I, you know, you, you need to fight your war your way, and when you get as old as I am, you kind of get used to things like this, and just everything he says is powerful. It's very powerful for the audience, too, because <laughs> we have always seen Kosh as wrong. The only exception to that ever has been when he did a similar thing with Jakar. You remember that? That's the only other time he's presented someone other than the implacable pillar. But now we see a warm, fatherly old man speaking as Kosh, and all of a sudden it just sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Because Kosh has always been the mentor figure. He has always been the kind, fatherly old man. He's just never really presented that in a way that we have perceived as we perceive such things. He has been, in short, very alien and very prideful. And I love that they actually bought, draw attention to that, to his pride. To the fact that Kosh thought he was above these kind of things. And it took Sheridan to convince him of otherwise. To push through his pride and his fear to cause him to take action. It's, oh, it's such a great scene. And of course what Sheridan does to convince him is a wonderfully Vorlon thing to do. I could summarize the, the Vorlon mentality in a single sentence. What is, is. The Vorlons are. And in that moment... When Sheridan was talking to the encounter suit, Sheridan was. And that's what ends up really piercing the barrier and really pushing through that pride and then that fear and really connecting with the individual underneath all of that. The crew, the people who work on B5, were devastated by Kosh's death. It was actually not originally planned to happen here. It was always planned to happen, but not here. And JMS talks about this. This is another writing concept I want to mention in brief, just briefly here, if you'll forgive me. Um, anybody who's been a writer for a length of time understands this concept, so I hope you'll just start nodding your head at me here. Because after a certain point in time, your characters sort of take a life on their own. I mean, obviously you're still writing them, but 
you when you write a sufficiently complex and in-depth character you start to learn that character and rather than thinking what is it I want them to do you start to think what is it they would do because now you have a character established and can extrapolate based on that or in the more romanticized version they talk they take on a life of their own JMS himself said that Kosh is the one who convinced him that this had to happen here and in this way and I totally get what he means by that. Again, you know, nodding my head here. I, I get it. This had to happen, and this had to happen at this moment. The shadows are moving openly. The Vorlons needed to move openly, too, or else they would never get the momentum they needed. Sheridan would never get the push he needed, and the, the moment would be lost. Because this is a very powerful moment, and that's why it hit this crew so damn hard. There are people who didn't even want to talk to JMS for a couple of days afterwards. This was a powerful thing to do. And, uh, yeah, I, I actually don't know what else to add to that. Other than, of course, the assertion that things can always get worse. <laughs> I'll see you next time, guys.